This is the Life Stances Podcast, and I'm your host, Lori Beeman. In this podcast, we're exploring life stances in a world of religious change. Life stances are what we think about the world, how we live and act within it, and how we relate to other people, other animals, and the environment. With an increasing number of people identifying as non-religious, this podcast explores how religious change impacts society. In the coming months, we'll look at weddings, funerals, palliative care, charitable giving and volunteering, forest burials, and other topics related to the changing religious landscape. I hope you'll join us. We're in the midst of an environmental crisis. No matter where you live, there's a good chance you've seen extreme weather events like record temperatures, forest fires, tornadoes, or flooding. At the same time, we're witnessing massive extinction of plant and animal species and the degradation of diverse ecosystems like forests and coral reefs. What does all of this have to do with religion and non-religion? That's what we consider in this episode. There are many religious narratives about human relationships with nature. One such narrative is hierarchical, with God placing humans at the top of a chain of being. In this view, even if the relationship is framed as one where God has entrusted humans to look after nature or take care of nature, there remains the idea that humans are in some way above or separate from nature. But there are also religious narratives that see the relationship as precisely that, a relationship where humans are but one part of a wider web of natural relationships with plants, non-human animals, and other organisms. Of course, there are also scientific narratives that privilege humans above their fellow terrestrials, for example, by making humans the measure against which all other organisms are compared. But there seems to be a reshaping of the relationship between humans and the world in which we live that represents a new way of thinking about our place in the world. This may be because the structures that had traditionally supported hierarchical views of nature are changing. One of those structures is religion. As more and more people become non-religious and the influence of religion declines, this might open space to reconsider this hierarchical relationship. And people with a religious affiliation are also rethinking the human relationship with the world in the face of the climate crisis. Let's think more about the place of nature within Christianity. To do this, we spoke with Nancy Menning, a visiting scholar at Ithaca College in New York who has a background in both religious studies and environmental studies. As she notes, there's a lot of complexity in Christian views about how humans relate to nature. When we think about the Christian narrative about non-human animals, it's good to just start with the opening stories. Certainly in Genesis 1, what do we see in that mythic tale? We see a God who creates spaces for creatures to flourish in, creating the sky area for birds and other animals of the air to flourish in creating the waters and the land for other beings to flourish in, and then populating those realms with a diversity of creatures in Genesis 1, after each day of which of that creation, God proclaims it good. And on the final day of the creation, when God is creating the other land animals, creates the human land animal along with the others, and in the fullness of that creation, declares it very good. And so the narrative is one in which the divine figure, the biblical God, wants to create spaces within which diverse lives can flourish. You can turn the page and go on to another creation narrative inside the Genesis scriptures. And here we see the God operating at a smaller, closer scale in the garden and realizing that the garden needs someone to care for it and tend it. This is God who's going to be an absentee landowner in some sense and wants someone to stand in. And so the human is created to tend and care for this garden that belongs to God. And then God, open yet to new experiences, says, wow, the dude is lonely. This dude needs someone to hang out with. 
and brings all the animals, all the non-human animals before Adam to say, hey, how's this one to hang out with? And it doesn't quite work, but I think the insight there is that we can come pretty close. That biblical story tells us that we can have relationships with animals um, that are part of our relationship and kinship networks, even if we may have preferential options for certain humans. We also see a story there in which the narrative suggests to us that our role here is to tend and care for the place. The stories go on and on in Christian scriptures. Any kind of reflection on the history of the planet, and when we read these stories, we try to understand what these narratives might mean in the context of our lived lives in a modern science-informed world. And one has to ponder deeply the centrality of humankind, if that's the way we think we have it here, given the long, long, long history that has unfolded in deep time since the Big Bang, where we show up in the last couple seconds of the day. And God must have been doing something in all that time, whatever God you want to call. We can't possibly be the center stage here. Our role is to be in relationship. Finally, I, I think maybe taking a gospel story, there's a story about a couple of sparrows in the gospel accounts and a claim that Jesus makes to the folks he's talking to that God cares for those sparrows, perhaps cares for people more. Um, the writer thinks that was true anyhow. But we have, I think throughout the scriptures, the image of a biblical God um, who is in love with creation and takes delight in creation and wants all of creation to flourish. The story Nancy tells is complex. The notions of dominion and then stewardship have been important concepts in Christian history. The idea of dominion suggests that humans have been given absolute authority to rule over nature. Although dominion has largely been replaced with the perhaps more benign notion of stewardship, this focuses on humans taking care of nature or to act as a steward of it, it still invokes a hierarchical relationship between humans and the world around us. Here's Nancy again. I've struggled a lot with stewardship. Before I was a religious studies scholar, I was in forestry and environmental studies and natural resource management and thought about the way in which stewardship seemed to be imposed upon the world for human interests. And and sometimes in violent ways, and sometimes used to justify God put us here to do what we wanted with the planet and with its beings. And that always seemed to miss something for me. And so for decades now, I've been leaning away from stewardship and trying to retell those opening stories of Genesis in ways that are not highlighting the language of Genesis 126, something about having dominion over. Through that whole time, I've been aware that one has to think about what one could possibly mean by dominion. And again, where I've come down on that is that the divine God, the divine biblical God's character seems to be one of taking delight in the creation and wanting its flourishing. That's a relationship of agape in the kind of love language that biblical scholars use. It is a, a deep, attentive caring for the well-being of the one whom you are expressing that love to. And God seems to have that. Now, if God then calls that dominion, God is king is the, the sense there, ruler of some type, then it's not a despotic tyrannical kind of rule that God is evidencing to us. And if we then take the role of steward, which is acting on behalf of the actual owner, the, the, the divine figure, the biblical God, then one would imagine we should take on the attributes of that divine figure's care for the planet. And so I've been aware that you can turn around that dominion language of Genesis 1 verse 26 in ways that make the domination of dominion fall away. 
And yet I've still been super hesitant about it. And then in the most recent years, probably very strongly in the last year or two, it's occurred to me that the language needs to be reclaimed in a way. And it is because when I work with indigenous peoples and talk about their relationships to the land, they talk about stewardship all the time. And that relationship that they have with the land and desire to have again with the land, if allowed to, is one of this reciprocal care and compassion and attentiveness. That seems to me what that stewardship should really be. And so I'm at the turning point in my own reflection with the term stewardship, um, committed to not letting it be a tyrannical rule over things, but definitely a deeply engaged responsible, loving interaction. Whether stewardship can be reconstituted to support a non-hierarchical relationship between humans and nature remains to be seen. But there are glimmers of possibility even within the Christian tradition itself. For example, Nancy singles out St. Francis of Assisi, the medieval Christian monk. A subversive voice in the medieval period was certainly St. Francis of Assisi who is well known within and beyond Christianity for talking about things like brother, son, sister, moon, always referring to the elements of creation, non-human, animals, plants, stars, whatnot, as relational kin at the same level. Not son, not father, usually brother and sister sibling sparrow in ways that reshaped a more dominant narrative perhaps that put humans above animals closer to the angels and among those humans of course men more important than women and i don't know that anybody but white men was in mind there and so we can look at the history of the traditions and the ways in which individuals and groups have risen up with alternative stories and we each then have the opportunity the invitation to choose the story that we think will create a better future as humans become more aware of the climate crisis and the harms we're doing to the earth we ask nancy whether she thinks that hierarchical views of nature are beginning to break down here's her response my suspicion is uh yeah i come from a non-hierarchical kind of worldview and tradition and history uh, personally and so i'm always suspicious of the hierarchies but sometimes when i see hierarchies asserting themselves forcefully and tyrannically it seems to me the last gasp of a system that is unraveling now the challenge will be that when things continue to unravel and you know certainly technology is an aid here in distributing uh power and points of view. Um, But as hierarchical structures unravel, there are always going to be those left among the rubble (laughs) that has collapsed who will try to rise up yet again um, and create hierarchical relationships over people and to live within that moment of being with one another on equal, mutually caring and supportive uh, networks of relationship is ever an ongoing challenge. Nancy suggests that we think about nature through a relational lens rather than a hierarchical one. In other words, humans are in relationship with nature, not above it. One way that humans deal with inequality and injustice is through human rights. Admittedly, the process of extending rights equally to all people has been a bit uneven and is still ongoing. But if all humans possess rights that guarantee them certain protections, some people think that perhaps we should also grant rights to non-human animals as well, or to other forms of life, like plants and trees and even to rivers. Many individuals and groups advocate for the great apes, that is bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas and orangutans, to be granted legal personhood. In 2015, a court in Argentina did just that, granting legal personhood to an orangutan named Sandra. The court ordered that she be moved from captivity in the Buenos Aires Zoo. Sandra, now 37 years old, 
currently lives at the Center for Great Apes Sanctuary in Florida. In the United States, the Non-Human Rights Project has made similar legal arguments that non-human animals like chimpanzees and elephants possess rights and cannot be held in captivity. So far, these arguments have not been successful. In other countries, we have also seen the expansion of the idea of rights to nature. In 2017, the Wanganui River in New Zealand was granted legal personhood in a Maori-led initiative. Guardians were appointed to act in the river's interests. We talked with legal expert Victoria Enkvist, an associate professor of law at Uppsala University in Sweden, about extending rights beyond human beings. She cautions that granting rights can be complex. Scholars have insisted that you have to look at politics and the power of the specific situation. Who holds the power to represent nature and how powerful are those rights in comparison uh, with other rights? Uh, and also a related and important question is, at what level do the rights exist? At the constitutional level, uh, international level, a national level or a local level? In 2015, I think, uh, Ecuador's constitutional court declared that the rights of nature impacted all other rights because those rights are recognized in the constitution. On the other hand, courts in the U.S. have ruled local rights of nature laws are constitutional. So it depends on how the right is constructed and where the right is in the system. Granting rights to non-human animals and to nature means that humans may need to give up some of our privileges. Extending rights to nature means that there are things that matter other than human interests and concerns. The goal for many advocates of rights of nature is to create a shift in the balance in society so that nature and its values gain a stronger position in relation to other interests, such as, for example, economic growth. The idea behind rights of nature, as it stands now anyway, is to create rights within the framework of existing rights systems. And part of the movement around rights of nature is to make nature a legal subject to change it from being an object that humans can own to being a subject. At the same time, there will be a lot of balancing interest that must be done even if nature is given its own rights. Even in a jurisdiction that has granted rights to nature, in any given legal dispute, nature may appear both as an object of someone else's property rights and as a subject with independent rights. As Victoria says, granting rights means changing how we think about nature. Nature is no longer just an object for humans to possess, but a subject with its own agency. This recognizes that non-human animals, for example, have their own lives and their own subjective experiences and goals. Of course, like so much, the devil is in the details. But I think also it is crucial to highlight the importance of how the wording is in the regulations, because if the wording is not clear and concrete, the, the protection will not be that useful anyway, because then you can interpret it in so many ways. So it's not a uh, protection at all. I think that Ecuador is a good example for where it, where it has been working, because there the, the rights of nature got a place in the constitution, and the constitution were, and the, the, the right in, in itself was so concrete, so it could be used in legal processes. In Sweden, we don't have a uh, right to nature in the, in the constitution, but we have a protection for nature in our constitution, but it's in the preamble. So it's much more difficult for the right to get a meaning. Can extending rights to non-human animals, rivers, and nature bring us back from the brink of planetary devastation? The legal framework of rights is one piece of the puzzle, but as Victoria notes, even if we make these legal changes, we'll also need to make changes in how we live. It's evident that we have to do a shift in our way of living because otherwise it, it's not going to go well. <laughs> and then we pursue different tracks to, to solve that problems. Through religion, for example, through ways of uh, looking upon nature in other ways, to research about sustainability. I think that we have a lot of different ways of uh, pursuing solutions.
So far, our discussion has been abstract, exploring Christian narratives of the environment and legal rights-based ways of thinking about how to protect nature. So let's think a bit more about what people do. To answer this question, we spoke with Anita Kreitz, a Toronto-based activist who is the co-founder of Toronto Pig Save and the Global Animal Save Movement. She's also the global campaign coordinator for the Plant-Based Treaty, which aims to put animal agriculture at the center of climate activism. Anita's complex life stance includes both religious and non-religious elements. Her activism and her personal convictions are intertwined. She describes how she became a vegetarian at university and later a vegan. She then became more involved in activism upon moving to Toronto after teaching at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Here's Anita. The next transformative thing that happened to me is when I moved back to Toronto. You know, I loved living by the lake in Kingston. So when I moved back to Toronto, I wanted to live by the lake. And so I moved near a pig slaughterhouse, unbeknownst to me. And I thought, oh, somebody should do something about that. And I did nothing until I adopted a dog, Mr. Bean. And we would walk every morning on Lakeshore. And this was like four years after I moved in the area. And that was the first time I saw the pigs in the truck. And uh, I, when I was teaching at Queen's, my they let me teach one course of my choice. And it was social movement strategies and tactics. So I had read a lot of like Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, um, King, so forth. And so... What I thought was what it was important at that point when when we saw the pigs in the truck was like if you see an injustice don't pass the buck like do something about it you know and, and sort of I was uh, living near the slaughterhouse wasn't enough which is scary to me I was a vegan and an activist but that wasn't enough but when I saw the pigs the faces of the pigs that's what was the epiphany you know it sort of was transformative it just made those animals like like a priority in my life. And based on the experiences I already had from like learning about social movements, I knew that you couldn't do an event once a year, that you would have to stage frequent direct actions. So we did, we, we, the first time I walked up to the truck and looked at a, a pig, the, the, this beautiful pig that was all dirty and then, and, and like all this dirt on their, her, her face, like I, I just promised the pig that we would do a minimum of three vigils a week. And we kept that promise. And so we, three vigils, cause I looked very close, like, to, to this downtown pig slaughterhouse. So we did three vigils a week. And in terms of your question about, you know, how do we relate to animals and what's the language, what the light, what language do we use? When we did the vigils, we never said like, oh, eat less meat, or we never used that kind of language. We just right away, because, because when you see the animals firsthand, you know, you want all of them to be freed. And all of it, it's just like a dog, a, a, a truck full of dogs. Like you wouldn't say, oh, you know, eat less dogs, uh, you know. So right away, we it was very animal centric when you bear witness to these animals at vigils. And so we would, you know, use language like non-human animals and, and call for veganism. And, you know, very, it was very simple. We didn't worry too much about framing and how the rest of the world saw animals in the very speciesist way. Because when you're doing these vigils every week and you're relating to these animals, they sort of defined how our agenda. So yeah, so that's uh, that was transformative. The idea for holding vigils was inspired in part by the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, who called for bearing witness to injustice. Bearing witness is defined as by Leo Tolstoy as coming as close as you can and trying to help. And obviously the right thing would be to, co- to keep on going closer and closer, whether it's the kill floor or, you know, whatever it is, and, and in trying to help in rescuing these animals. And so our our bearing witness is all usually just partial, although we've rescued a few hundred animals in the worldwide movement. You know, we've bore witness to millions and millions. And even that partial form, it makes you feel terribly guilty and awful, but it's important to do because it's, you, it's, uh, you know, you have this choice to look away or to come close and try to help. And and even if you take us some steps towards trying, you know, coming close and trying to help, you're doing the right thing. And so our our mission has always been how do you convince other people? Because it's it's very inspiring and motivating to be at these vigils and seeing other people who care and they're not looking away. And it's very painful to go to these places. Like who wants to go to a slaughterhouse? Like it doesn't even occur to people. It didn't occur to me, even though I was a vegan and an activist when I first moved into this area. It didn't even occur to me. Like I thought, oh, somebody should do something. Like that was my attitude. And I even like called a, a, like a group in Hamilton that I knew was active. I thought, oh, they should come down and leaflet. Like it just, 
it's just so we live in such a privileged human supremacist world that it doesn't even occur to us that even if we're vegans or environmentalists like to do more you know that's that's what i thought was shocking and it was only when i saw the animals face to face i go oh my god everybody has to see this that was my that was my reaction so that was very motivating like when you you know just seeing and that's true for other social movements like if you're in the civil rights movement like if you've seen things firsthand you know it's it's very motivating it's like an epiphany as Anita explains, she draws from multiple sources in her activism. So when we first started the Save Animal State movement and the vigils, Gandhi was very important. He wrote three books in English, his uh, autobiography, or Experiments with Truth, in Swaraj, and uh, Direct Action in South Africa. And then um, I think Tolstoy has been really important, like his non nonfiction. Uh, even one of his fiction books, Resurrection, he wrote of the ones who became an ethical vegetarian. So, you know, he wrote War and Peace, he sat at Karenina before he became, so they're they're great, but they're, I think the, his other books are even much better in terms of ethics. So he wrote nonfiction books on nonviolence, um, like The Kingdom of God is Within You. It's a really beautiful book that influenced Gandhi uh, in South Africa in the early 1890s. He wrote uh, Calendar of Wisdom. That's where we get a lot of our quotes, like the Bearing Witness quote. That was his favorite book. Like he wrote 600 books and articles in his life. And he said his most important book was that book because he thought it could have the greatest positive impact on the world. And it just contains sayings and uh, from all the different religions, all these different sages from thousands of years and, and his own thoughts as well. Tolstoy, like Gandhi after him, drew a lot of inspiration from the different religions. People thought like Tolstoy was a Christian anarchist. He, he wasn't Christian any more than he was uh, drawing from all the other religions. And that's very clear if you read his nonfiction books and A Calendar of Wisdom. It draws from all the religions like Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, like, you know, um, atheism, like, you know, spiritualism. Like he draws from all the different philosophical thoughts. And Gandhi did that too. Like he was really someone who would try to unify human beings in terms of like, you know, drawing from the best from all the different religions. So he wasn't interested in the, you know, the parts that like miracles or uh, reincarnation, you know, or uh, resur you know, resurrection of Christ, all that stuff. He was he was not interested in any of that. He was only interested in the golden rule, uh, love thy neighbor, turn the other cheek, you know, that kind of thing, you know, like sharing and, you know, like, you know, opposing wealth. He was against land ownership, you know, so like, yeah, so he just tried to take the best from the different religi religions. And often there was a lot of overlap, like the golden rule and, you know, another like love thy neighbor and, you know, things like that. So, so that's where, you know, I, I tried to draw on, you know, concepts like nonviolence and turn the other cheek. Anita is one of the leaders of an initiative called the Plant-Based Treaty. When we ask Anita to imagine her ideal future, she talks about the importance of having big, ambitious visions as a way to confront the climate crisis. I think we would make progress in terms of animal equality. Um, just like, you know, the civil rights movement's objective was equality. So I think uh, the world that Plant-Based Treaty outlines is one in which we transform our, our food system to plant-based so that we can live within our planetary boundaries and rewild the earth. So there's a book by E.O. Wilson called Half Earth. He thinks like half the earth should be like forested and protected. And so, yeah, so the, those are the kinds of visions I'm interested in exploring. And I, I think it's such a good question you ask because we have to articulate our vision in order to make progress towards it. And, and, and there is there is a pathway. Like, like, let's try to map it out. Like, the, you know, and you know, what's disappointing in that other book that it, we, we mentioned earlier was um, the book about forests. The hidden life life of trees. He says, "Oh, like oh, in Germany, there's some group that's calling for protection of, I don't know. I think he said five percent. But even if we protected two percent, that would be you know this many square miles." I thought, like, no, like, and he goes, "Oh, that's an embarrassing call to action because you know we're asking the Amazon nations to protect the Amazon. Like, no, like we need to have a vision where we say fifty percent, not two percent." She's like, "So we we you know especially you know after reading his marvelous book." about how incredible trees are and forests are, uh, let's let's start, ha like, we need to ask these questions. What is our vision? 
you know, what, what should we be working towards? So let's, let's have an ambitious vision because in order to survive, in order not to like pass a lot of tipping points and in order to like stop this incredible rate of mass extinction, we're going to have to have these, these big ideas. Finally, we asked Anita about whether she is optimistic about the future. I, I find the human species very disappointing, but there's always, uh, uh, there, there's, there's also the capacity for incredible good. And so the question is, you know, will that, will we organize and, you know, there's potential, but because these, there's all these filters and all this misinformation, this context, like they're not getting a good context. They're not getting good information. In terms of human nature, I think it's, there's a lot of potential for good, but it could be very easily misdirected, you know, for selfishness, for ignorance, for diversion, for all that. So like, you know, we got, it's a huge project to try to save the planet. Like it's, it's, it's very difficult. I, I tend to be a half cup, half full type of person, but in terms the more you learn about all these issues, like it gets quite disappointing. In terms of how you know humans behave, the capacity for evil, the capacity for violence, the capacity for tribalism, all these things that divide people and divide people from nature, from other animals, you know. So like it's like so our project is how to unify. We're all the same, you know. We all came from common origins. We're all equal, you know. Like how do you, you know, that's our struggle. You know, how are we going to help? Will we win this? You know, I hope we do because we we literally are. Like we're all just the same. We're we're just equal, you know. We're we're, uh, you know. But we back to the principle: love thy neighbor, golden rule. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. It's very simple. In previous episodes, we've talked about the rising number of people claiming no religious affiliation. But what impact has this shift had on our relationship to the environment? It's possible that the changes we're seeing in our society are also transforming the idea that humans have a special place at the top of a hierarchy of being. Dominion and stewardship may be giving way to other kinds of relationships with multiple sources of inspiration and authority, as we saw in Anita's description of what inspires her. This opens a space where we can rethink our relationship with the environment, with nature, and with the world around us as fellow terrestrials rather than as humans and animals. Old hierarchies with humans placed clearly on top seem to be flattening and giving way to a greater sense of equality between humans and other forms of life we share the planet with. While the shift may be uncomfortable or difficult to accept, many people now see the results of our dysfunctional relationship with nature and realize that things need to change. Whether this relationship will shift quickly enough in order to stem the consequences of climate change is ultimately up to us. We hope you'll join us next time as we continue to explore the impacts of non-religion on our future. Mm-hmm.